Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 121 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me today is Alex Joski. Alex is an analyst and researcher who focuses on the Chinese government and Chinese Communist Party. He has worked for the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and has also written articles which have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and with NBC News. I invited Alex onto the podcast after reading his book, Spies and Lies, How China's Greatest Covert Operations Fooled the World. It's about the incredible effort China has put into influencing world opinion over the past few decades and how they've successfully lulled so many people and governments into a false sense of security and complacency as to their true intentions. But before we dive into this story, I want to ask you something. Are you an amateur military historian like me? Has this podcast rekindled your interest in Eastern Europe and the Cold War? Maybe you're finally getting into reenacting and living history just like you've always said you would. If so, you should check out the incredible collection of surplus military goods at krushiki.com. Krush himself scours the continent for the best uniforms and field equipment available and delivers them right to your door. He's got almost anything you can imagine and many things you haven't. Uniforms from East Germany, the Soviet Union, and modern-day Bulgaria, Poland, and Russia are all available. Rucksacks, mess kits, and load-bearing gear are also up on the site right now. The inventory is constantly changing, so you never know what kind of gems you might stumble on, all at a very affordable price. Find it all at krushiki.com. That's K-R-U-S-C-H-I-K-I.com. And use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 for 10% off your order. Alex, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, of course. You know, even after more than 100 episodes now, more than 120, I've barely touched on Chinese intelligence operations and influence campaigns. So, you know, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk about them with someone who is so knowledgeable and renowned as you are. Yeah, thank you. It's really, I think, quite an overlooked subject in this field of intelligence studies and, and spycraft. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And hopefully I can shed a little bit more light on that, or you can shed a little more light through me anyway, with people who are very interested in exactly what's been going on over the past few years. So can you tell me about your own personal first encounters with Chinese influence operations? Yeah, so I, I lived in China for six years as a kid and a teenager growing up there, learning Chinese, living in Beijing. And then I came back to Australia. I went to university here in Canberra. And it really shocked me kind of coming across these allegations that the Chinese Student Association at my university was informing on students to the Chinese government, was seeking to censor dissident media outlets that were critical of the Chinese government, and organizing pro-Chinese Communist Party propaganda activities. And so what I did was, as a student, I wrote about this, I interviewed people, I tried to investigate what was going on and I really tried to flesh out that picture and, you know, in response, uh, members of the student association followed me around, uh, tried to kick me out of their events. And it was really quite a scary thing back then. It doesn't sound as scary in retrospect, I think, but uh, it, it was really surprising to me, especially, you know, coming back from China, you know, to Australia and then really feeling that the Chinese Communist Party was in a way still around. Yeah, I have to imagine that would be very, very disconcerting after you've left that country and, and find that they have kind of spread their influence all over the world. And I don't recall if you specifically mention it in the book, but the uh, Confucius Institutes here in the United States have also gotten a fair bit of attention, probably not as much as they deserve, but they've you know done exactly the same thing at dozens of different places here in the U.S. over the past couple of decades. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's amazing the the level of reach that they have. So I want to ask you just very, very broadly speaking, because I know that we'll get into the specifics of it, but how do China's national intelligence strategies kind of differ from their Western counterparts? I think there are a few things that are different. 
One is probably just the scale of China's intelligence apparatus. I think sort of the latest figures that have come out of governments have been about 200,000 personnel in the Ministry of State Security. And alongside that, you've got you know, military intelligence agencies, sort of policing agencies that have police, secret police-like functions. And then you have these specialized influence agencies that don't really have clear counterparts in the West. Probably the best known of these now is the United Front Work Department, which really specializes in rallying, influencing, building relationships with groups outside the party to align their activities with what the party does. So I think it's this integration of covert and clandestine intelligence work with influence work, and even to some degree with sort of overt or relatively open influence activities. This combination is a really important and unique feature of how Chinese intelligence agencies operate. That was one thing that was really surprising to me about the book is just how overt the influence activities are. Can you talk about how these intelligence agencies take those on in an overt way, as opposed to what we think of, you know, more clandestine and naturally, you know, secretive kind of intelligence operations, traditional intelligence operations? Yeah, exactly. To that point, I think, you know, a lot of your readers, your listeners will be familiar with generally how Russian and Soviet Union intelligence agencies operate, how they emphasize, you know, careful tradecraft to make sure you're not being tracked to keep com communications between yourself and, and an agent hidden using dead drops, that sort of thing. I saw a lot less evidence of that on the Chinese side. There is good tradecraft, but I think rather than just relying on tradecraft and you know, assuming that your cover is blown and so you have to lose your tail, Chinese intelligence officers quite often really believe in their cover and the strength of that cover. So posing as a journalist, spending decades working as a journalist and publishing articles, but also you know, using that access to gather intelligence, to run influence operations, to try to recruit people inside foreign governments, uh, but not using the sort of tradecraft that would really mark someone out as not really being a journalist. You know, if you're posing as a journalist and you're, you're, you're making dead drops or you're you're walking around the block twice to see if anyone's tailing you, that really gives away the fact that you're actually an intelligence officer. So I think there's a kind of a trade-off where China has picked a different spot in that spectrum to Russia and probably most Western countries where they, they really emphasize the importance of cover and living that cover story. Yeah, speaking of living that cover story, there was a couple of people that you mentioned by name in the book or you, you cover extensively in the book, and they lived under aliases even in China back home for many, many years. I would assume that that, of course, goes on in foreign countries, but they were truly, truly living that second life is what it seemed to me um, their entire life, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's right. It was really quite sort of startling to me to see uh, the alias of an MSS officer as an actual member of China's parliament, the National People's Congress. This is a guy called Yuan Guang. This is his name in official records of China's National People's Congress, but he's better known to people in the MSS as Vice Minister Yu Fang. So he really lived this double life of, on the one hand, a highly respected, highly capable foreign intelligence officer at the upper echelons of the Ministry of State Security, but then publicly had quite an extensive profile as a journalist, as a, a Chinese politician and lawmaker, and a key figure in Chinese relations with the United States. He's a great example of, I think, that, that use of cover and how public some of these key offices are because of, I think, all the benefits that having a public persona has for intelligence work and especially influence work. Yeah, I've never heard of anything comparable to that in the past. It might have happened, but it's not come up to me in any of my readings or research or anything either. So that was a very, very unique aspect of this whole story, I thought. So you mentioned a minute ago that the Ministry of State Security has an estimated 200,000 employees, and I find that shocking. I would have guessed previously, I would have guessed on the high end, maybe 50,000 or something like that, but clearly I was way, way, way off. So can you talk a little bit about the origins of the MSS and how they grew to the level of, of power and size that they are now? 
Yeah, the MSS is sort of a relatively young intelligence agency by international standards. It was set up in 1983, but it didn't kind of come out of nothing. Uh, one of its key predecessor agencies was called the Central Investigation Department, and it had quite extensive and I think a very secret but illustrious history of successful covert action around the world. Uh, it was involved in preventing assassinations against Chinese Communist Party leaders in, in countries like Cambodia when they were on official trips. It was involved in managing the defections of top officials from the rival Republic of China, now Taiwan. And it was you know, fomenting revolution and, and running guns to Maoist rebels in, in Africa and, and even in, in North America. So the MSS kind of grew out of that tradition, but also combined that with domestic security and policing functions. It, it took up that role in part upon its founding. So it's a unique, it's a relatively unusual combination of domestic law enforcement powers and, and secret police powers with espionage and, and foreign intelligence work that makes it a bit more akin to the KGB than what you see in the West, where those two functions are, are, are generally quite distinct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And do you think that they have kind of managed that growth and that spread effectively, at least from their perspective? Are they, or is, are they spread too thin or trying to do too much under a single umbrella, perhaps? Yeah, I think it, it certainly is a lot to cover. But one, another really unique feature of the Chinese intelligence apparatus that's, that's quite important is this sort of regional structure where most operations, you know, to penetrate the US government, to, to recruit sources, to steal foreign technology are actually run by provincial agencies. So the MSS is sort of the headquarters hmm. of a national network where you have, for example, the Shanghai State Security Bureau, which reports up to the Shanghai government, uh, a city government, as well as the Ministry of State Security. So every province of China has its own foreign intelligence and espionage apparatus, as well as counterintelligence and so on. And that's part of why hmm. the scale of the state security apparatus is, is so extreme in China, because it's, it's down at local levels, it's down in the provinces, it's, it's in every major city of China. So yeah, really, really a sprawling network of intelligence work that I think permeates the Chinese government. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. I see. That is very unusual. And are these provincial headquarters, are they also running foreign operations as well or only internal operations? Like are there, you know, agents potentially from multiple provincial organizations inside the United States or inside Australia at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they probably have a slightly larger domestic focus around monitoring dissidents, monitoring foreign organizations and consulates, countering intelligence, that sort of thing. But probably most of the actual prosecutions or accusations made by the U.S. government of MSS activity against the United States have actually been attributed to these provincial branches. So, for example, the Shanghai State Security Bureau was you know, accused of recruiting a U.S. student who was doing an exchange program at a Chinese university in Shanghai, paying him to apply for jobs inside the U.S. government, including the CIA. He kept failing these exams. They were paying him tens of thousands of dollars. But at the same time, you know, during the same period, the Shanghai State Security Bureau was also running the same thing, kind of same kind of thing against, for example, the, the Japanese government. Uh, they were later found to be to have recruited uh, a U.S. Uh, embassy official inside China. So I think that even though these are provincial or local agencies, they're they're actually at the forefront of international intelligence operations by the Chinese government. Hmm. Yeah, that is that is very surprising, I have to admit, but it, they seem to be running it successfully, at least. Alex, I want to go back to chapter, I think it was chapter one of your book, as a matter of fact, you mentioned back in the early 80s, uh, this incredible anecdote that I was not aware of until I read the book about uh, George Soros attempting to gain access to China, kind of open up China in the early 1980s, and how that went very differently than he had originally anticipated. So can you kind of walk us through that story about George Soros and what happened once he came into China? Yeah, it was a really fascinating case to look at because George Soros is sort of so widely known for his political philanthropy these days and activism for, you know, liberal political causes. And, and China was actually one of the first places where he pursued this. So 
in about 1986, he really honed in on China as a place where he thought there were liberal trends, there were trends towards greater freedom and, and perhaps even political reform inside the Chinese system. So he made contacts you know, quite successfully and established a foundation that was funding research in China, was funding research on free markets, um, research on politics and, and Chinese political history, and I think really doing a, a lot of really great political philanthropy. But very quickly, of course, the state security organs of the Chinese Communist Party cottoned onto this, uh, put pressure on the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party who had backed this venture, uh, put pressure on you know, members of uh, Soros's fund in China, and basically forced them to partner with the front for the Ministry of State Security in order to secure this foundation's continued existence and ability to operate inside China. So you had this vice minister of the MSS, who I mentioned earlier, known to Soros as Yu Enguang, but known inside the MSS as Yu Fang, became the sort of Chinese co-chair of this foundation. You know, just a, a very bizarre sort of scenario that I think in Soros's eyes at the time was really the only way forward for his foundation to exist inside China. The MSS seems to have sold the line that it was actually protecting the foundation from even more conservative hardliners within the party who just wanted to shut it down entirely. Uh, but what, what seemed to be happening was that the sort of legitimacy, the contacts, the funding of Soros's foundation in China were actually being co-opted by this MSS front organization. And it very quickly fell apart. Uh, it wasn't sustainable. The 1989 Tiananmen massacre really had broader reverberations again uh, in, inside Chinese politics and society that led to the shutting down of Soros's foundation. Uh, but to me, it was really a remarkable example of an MSS vice minister directly engaging with the sort of top foreign elite to manage China's engagement with the outside world, manage the the growth of, of ideology and, and exchange of ideas between the West of China. And in that case, sort of a defensive move, I think, by the Chinese Communist Party to keep free market ideas and political liberalism and democracy from spreading too much in China. But I think it was really kind of a foundation in terms of the methodology and the confidence and that, that, that mission that later translated into really effective, aggressive and active foreign influence operations by the MSS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was a fascinating, fascinating story. And it gives tremendous insight, I think. And I, I don't know what your perception of is of George Soros. I'm sure you've read a lot more than I have about him. But he seems to have this reputation as this incredibly cagey and influential guy, influential guy who pulls the strings all over the world. And yet he goes into China and he just got outmaneuvered like immediately was my takeaway from the book. And he didn't have any success at all. And his whole organization was turned against him using his own money. It was just, it was a stunning story to me and very, very insightful, I thought. Yeah. And I thought another thing that stood out to me there is the insight it gave into the conspiratorial thinking of these hardline security parts of the Chinese Communist Party that they latched onto it so quickly and, you know, accused this of being a CIA plot, accused this of, of being some, some secret plot to overturn the Chinese Communist Party. And I think that sort of conspiratorial mindset is another reason for these active and aggressive foreign influence operations by the Chinese government, because they, in their eyes, the West is already doing this to us. Let's go do it back to them. There's no, there's nothing to be lost. Hmm. I see. I see. Interesting. So since you mentioned Tiananmen Square and the reverberations of that, what were the effects on the MSS at that time after the, the fallout of that uh, massacre? Yeah, it's a it's a really pivotal period in Chinese politics. You know, as as Soros observed in the 1980s, there there really was a kind of liberal uh, reformist current within the upper levels of parts of the Chinese government. But to me, the 1989 Tiananmen massacre was a sort of decisive defeat of that part of Chinese politics, and 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 signaled the return of hardline traditional leadership over the Chinese Communist Party. You know, the Chinese economy kept opening up gradually in the decades after that. But the Tiananmen massacre to the party leadership, together with, I think, the fall of the Soviet Union and the U.S. demonstration of military power in 1990 in, in Iraq, really, really 
convinced a lot of people in the Chinese Communist Party leadership that they were locked into a continual long-term struggle against capitalist democratic systems and that the West was hell-bent on trying to undermine socialist communist nations with China really standing out after the collapse of the Soviet Union as the most prominent of those. Uh, within the MSS, you, you of course, mm. had your hardliners who were really, who backed these, these activities, who were involved in monitoring protests and monitoring dissidents uh, around the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, but it was also something that triggered a wave of defections to the West. The reports I've read of the MSS really going into overdrive in, in foreign countries mainly to try to stop people from defecting and, and manage Chinese diplomatic missions, for example, and, and stop diplomats from jumping over to the West. So it really, I think, shook the party system to its core, but pushed it towards, I think, a more conspiratorial position in how it viewed the West. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. I was mostly aware of the total attempts to block information about Tiananmen getting out, but I wasn't really aware that the organization had kind of had to undergo so much change. All of the organizations had to undergo so much change in the aftermath of that, but I guess it shouldn't be surprising at all. So would you describe MSS as a political organization first and foremost? Are they there to guard the party more so than like strategic initiatives or something like that? Or are they an apolitical organization? Yeah, it's pretty hard, especially now to be apolitical in China. And I think when the MSS was set up, there was a kind of a veneer of it working for the people rather than the Chinese Communist Party. You know, technically, people to draw a distinction between the Chinese Communist Party and the government of China, sort of its, its public service, and some agencies are part of the Communist Party, some are part of the government of China. And the MSS is technically part of the government of China, but consistently its primary loyalty, and it's been very clear about this, has been to the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. And one of its key missions really a fundamental mission is to uphold and maintain the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, you know, whether that's by suppressing dissent, monitoring foreign activities in China, or going overseas to actually build an international environment that is in China's favor. And even, you know, now you see, I think, with Xi Jinping in power, a lot less of this pretense around a distinction between the party and the Chinese government and the MSS being much more overt and, and open about the fact that politics is at the core of its being. Another thing that really stood out to me was an interview with MSS Vice Minister Yu Feng, I think after his retirement, where he talked about what sorts of things the MSS looks for in recruits. And, you know, you normally expect things like analytical capability, people skills, foreign language skills. He said the number one requirement was political purity was their commitment to the ideology hmm. and, and mission of the Chinese community, of, of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the reality is not necessarily that, you know, I think, you know, you have corruption, you have people who, who defect and, and switch sides, but as an organization, the MSS is highly political. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. So Alex, I want to take it to a story from the book, also a name that might be familiar to some of my listeners, Katrina Lung. I haven't really talked about her much in the past, but uh, she was a major, major, major case here in the U.S., a counterintelligence case anyway. So can you talk about Katrina Lung and what she accomplished along the, uh, along the many years of her career here in the U.S.? Yeah, Katrina Lung was probably one of the earliest and, and certainly most significant China counterintelligence cases in the United States, landed in court in the very early 2000s. But she started her involvement in this world, at least in the early 1980s. She was recruited by the FBI as a sort of asset because of her ties to the Chinese community and people in the Chinese community who were essentially counterintelligence targets of the FBI. And very early on, it seemed like they were running her as a kind of double agent against the Chinese system. They sent her to China. They sent her to go offer herself to the MSS and meet the MSS and, and get taken around MSS facilities while working for the FBI. So the FBI, I think, initially thought I had this really great asset with broad access in the Chinese community in Los Angeles, but also quite unique access back into China, into the MSS, and, and even into Chinese politics 
So one one thing that really stood out in Katrina Long's career was that she was sort of credited with being able to get an audience with, I think, the the party secretary or the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party right after the 1989 Tiananmen massacre at a time when the, the party sort of went into lockdown and not much information was coming out. And you know, from a US government intelligence collection perspective, it would have been a high priority to, to understand how the Chinese government was reacting to it. So getting her in front of one of these politicians was really a win at the time, uh, at least that's how it was perceived. Uh, but pretty quickly, there were signs that she wasn't just a double agent. Uh, for the US, that she actually had a relationship with the Ministry of State Security that the FBI wasn't privy to. So one of the key things that tipped it off was uh, SIGINT. Uh, SIGINT that caught her on the phone uh, to an MSS, senior MSS officer called Mao Guohua, uh, using a code name, talking about operational details, uh, and this was all news to the FBI. So they'd, they'd either lost control of their double agent, or they'd never had a real double agent to begin with. She, she could have been MSS in some form from the very beginning. But another really remarkable aspect of this is that people remember her for that espionage, for you know, disclosing operational details and counterintelligence operations to the MSS, you know, in part for, for having an affair with her FBI handler, which is what enabled so much of this activity and what stopped it from being exposed for so long. But another really interesting thing is she was also tasked by the MSS, and I think this is forgotten, tasked by the MSS with political influence work. So at the same time as she was involved in counterintelligence and, and penetrating the US government in a way, the, this MSS officer she, who was handling her, Mao Guohua, sat down with her and the actual head of the MSS, and they said, you know, we want the Republican Party to win the next election. We want you to build up your contacts in this community here's a couple of thousand of dollars to, to do that and to make your way through political donations. We understand this is how US politics works and sent her back to the United States in the 1990s after this, this meeting. So really early on, this was an indication that the MSS wasn't just about internal security. It wasn't just about traditional espionage, but political influence and election interference and just political interference mm -hmm. more broadly was a key part of this MSS mission. Hmm. So all of this, especially the, the SIGINT captures that you mentioned, this seems like it would be a total showstopper the minute it came out. In hindsight, at least it does. So why is it that she was able to continue with her influence work and her actual intelligence operations for so long? Was it purely because of this personal relationship with the FBI handler that she had? Yeah, I think there was a, there was a lot of that. There was, I think, the, the Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Justice kind of found that her handler became such a star within the organization because of his work with her that his superiors were sort of deferential to him and there was really not much scrutiny or oversight hmm. of how he was running the case and people just defer to him and his judgment on on what was going on, not realizing that he was having an affair with her and mishandling classified documents. You would have thought that that sort of intercept would have triggered a different response, but it took many, many years until the early 2000s that charges were actually laid against Katrina Long. And even then, the prosecution was fraught. I think in her case, fell apart on some sort of technical grounds. So really kind of a quite a complex story with a lot of lessons for intelligence work. But one thing that, that I took from it was, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to include it in my book, even though there's a political influence angle. It's a, it's a widely known case that's already been written about in a lot of detail. But one of the things that, that I tried to add was I managed to find social media posts by one of Katrina Long's old handlers in the MSS, presumably now retired and not too concerned with operational security, and had just been publishing on Chinese social media about his life and writing little essays and posting, for example, photos of himself posing as a bookseller, a book publisher, visiting Los Angeles, visiting Katrina Lung, visiting the bookstore that she ran with MSS funding and support, photos of him with politicians in the United States. Really an incredible insight into the life and, and experiences of an MSS officer that I think kind of also helped tie the Katrina Lung case to this particular bureau of the MSS that I focused on called the Social Investigation Bureau, 
which seem to be the hub of these sorts of elite political influence operations. Yeah, they come up time and time again in your book. I definitely recall that. So from their perspective, even though she's now widely known, as you mentioned, and she was put on trial and everything, was was her work a, a success as far as they were concerned? Or did it unfortunately shed a light on their operations in the U.S. at a time when they wouldn't have wanted that? I, I think it was overall a success. You know, if you look at the timeline for close to two decades, she was probably working for the MSS with privileged access to information about FBI operations in Los Angeles and and FBI programs and continuing to be able to do this sort of political influence work and and community work, what we would now sort of call United Front work inside the Chinese community in that area. And remarkably, I think, you know, even though her case was exposed in the early 2000s, I don't think it really triggered a broader reaction and recognition of some of the serious of of what the MSS was, was doing, so it, it it you know it it caused the MSS to pause. Some of the officers who were involved used to travel frequently to the United States, and I think some of them stopped after her arrest. But I don't think it triggered the reaction that it could have. If you're looking for another discreet way to carry survival or emergency gear, look no further than the new covert Mark One briefs from Sotira Systems. The Mark 1s feature thigh pockets on either side, large enough for a phone, radio, passport, or other documents. The waistband contains nine slots for small items such as handcuff keys, SD and SIM cards, padlock shims, and the like. The elastic band keeps them snug but accessible. The covert Mark 1s are designed with comfort and utility at their core, and are manufactured from high-grade wicking and fast-drying sports fabric. They can easily replace a traveler's belt pack, which is far more likely to be stolen from you during a robbery than the briefs you're wearing. Covert Mark I briefs are configurable and suitable for anyone in law enforcement, military service, or even the security-conscious global traveler. Find them at sotirasystems.co.uk. That's S-O-T-E-I-R-A systems.co. Dot UK, or at the link in the show notes of this episode, and use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order. Hmm, I see. So you mentioned that she was ultimately not convicted of anything due to these technical considerations. Did she remain in the US or is she back in China at the moment? Yeah, so the last I saw was that she's in the US, that she'd actually married her former FBI handler. They turned up together a few years ago at the the funeral of sort of her Chinese community mentor. And she gave a speech at the funeral and they were sort of, they they both went together. And interestingly, this, this sort of mentor of hers was also someone who through these social media posts, I could place in, in contact and sort of continued contact with the same MSS officers that Katrina Lung was engaged with. So that was another thing that that surprised me wow. was that to this point that perhaps some of the broader lessons of the Katrina Leung case weren't necessarily taken up was that, you know, based on interviewing people in the community at the time, in the intelligence community, and also my own research with that social media, it was pretty clear that, you know, in the words of one officer, the whole US West Coast was a cesspool of corrupted cases at that point in time where you had people who had relationships with the FBI, but also relationships with the MSS. And in this person's assessment, the FBI didn't really have a good grip on their concurrent MSS relationship. My gosh. Amazing. They can pull all the strings in China and then they can come over to the West Coast and do the same thing on what should be our home territory. And they're still just as effective at that. That's incredible. You know, I was going to ask you a minute ago if the if you thought that her FBI handler had been blinded by love and now it seems like he certainly was if they are still together after everything that happened, you know, more than 20 years later, if they're still showing up at events together and married, that's, that's a real commitment. And it cost him everything and cost her a lot as well. It seems like. At least something good came out of it from their perspective. (laughs) Yeah. They found each other amidst all of this, at least. My gosh. So Alex on a kind of to pivot to another area of their work, it's this relationship building with influential people in foreign countries, obviously. So can you talk a little bit about how they might identify someone and they don't exactly 
recruit them. They just build a, a mutually beneficial relationship with someone who becomes sort of an advocate, like an open advocate in some cases, at least. Can you talk about how that occurs? Yeah, this was a, a really important part of what I focused on and, and what distinguishes the MSS, I think, was this this sort of this willingness and kind of happiness about operating in a gray space, you know, this space between cultivating someone and running them as a witting asset who's paid up, who's using tradecraft, that sort of thing, where because you had these MSS officers, some of them literally who had also been Katrina Long's handlers, who had built long stories and histories as journalists, as scholars in China, as cultural exchange officials, as, as book publishers, had a lot of good contacts and reputations internationally through those activities. And they built, you know, they, they built trust with a lot of people in the United States who uh, would go to them for access in China, uh, would call on them to help set up meetings with officials inside other parts of the Chinese government. Uh, and really seemed in some cases to rely or draw on these people for insight and special you know, access and knowledge regarding the politics of a very opaque and closed off political system, the Chinese Communist Party. So it, it was really you know, taking advantage of this fact that there are so many people out there who want to know what's really happening inside China. And also a lot of people out there who at the time I think had a lot of good intentions and genuine belief that China was reforming, that China was going to turn out like a Western country in some form, that the Communist Party was was sort of going to become irrelevant in the future, and China would eventually be a democratic system, uh, who were going to China and wanted to know more about this and wanted to meet democratic individuals within the Chinese government. And right there to meet them, in these cases I looked at, were actually undercover MSS officers posing as pro-democracy scholars who also had really good access to the Chinese government, uh, really good connections, uh, really good political capital that they could use to chaperone these people and, and get whatever meetings they wanted. It was really quite remarkable. And in a lot of these cases, it, it really didn't look like the targets of these operations had been recruited as assets of the MSS. They'd just been handled and carefully cultivated in this way where the relationship is the focus you know you with some of these targets you can't necessarily expect to recruit them you know if you're handling a former prime minister of australia on his trip to china for example i, I don't think i think you'd be silly to try to pitch them you know i'll give you ten thousand dollars if you spy for china there's you know that, that's not going to work on a former prime minister but what you can get is you can shape their understandings of the country you can get access through them and you can offer them access to the Chinese Communist Party in return. Amazing. Do you think that in in many cases with these individuals you're referring to, do they think that they are doing something that is of benefit to their home country, whether Australia, United States, and in actuality, they're just you know working to the benefit of MSS and the Communist Party, but they think that, I guess I should say, they're not doing this out of a divided loyalty or a desire to hurt their home country or anything like that. They're just that well manipulated that they end up doing what benefits the MSS most? Yeah, I think I think a lot of cases were like that. You know, there's always a spectrum. You know, you had people who were meeting with these MSS officers but kept their wits about them. You know, in some cases you you had people who were protected by the FBI and were actually in, you know, told, hey, these people you're meeting aren't really scholars, so just be careful around them. And I think that had some positive effects. Mm. But you had a lot of other people who are really blasé and reckless in their engagement with China. And then you have people who, who are probably just recruited by the Ministry of State Security. So I saw all, case, you know, all, all cases which sort of covered all different bits of that spectrum when it came to these, this, this core of MSS political influence officers. But there was just really a, a really happy alignment between what a lot of people believed about China at the time and what the Chinese Communist Party wanted them to believe about China. You know, it wasn't some mm -hmm. sort of masterful plot to uh, make up a huge facade and a sort of, you know, an elaborate fantasy about China. I think it, it, it was a fantasy, this idea that China would liberalize and become a democracy, but they weren't pulling the idea out of thin air. It was something that a lot of people believed and wanted to see. And the MSS was smart, smart enough to recognize that 
and reflect that back at people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting stuff. There was one anecdote that I would I would love for you to expound on a little bit in the book about a grad student, a Western grad student who went by the, I guess the pseudonym it was Barry in the book and how they attempted to recruit him. Can you talk about the the step-by-step process they went through with him? Yeah, this was a really, really interesting case where uh, a lot of what I could see from open source was some of these more prominent individuals like you know, the former national leaders, diplomats, well-known scholars, uh, interacting with MSS officers, the kinds of people who are probably a bit less likely to get crudely pitched by the MSS because of that status and are more likely to be kind of played and handled in this in this careful way. But it was a really different story when it came to some of these more junior early career people who these MSS officers were also just pitching and targeting and trying to recruit as part of these operations. You know, it really showed to me, I think, some of the, the dangers in this activity. I think a lot of people at the time, even if they had some sort of inkling that they were dealing with the MSS, kind of brushed it off and said, oh, they're not, they're not pitching me. They haven't harmed me. So it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, but actually... A lot of other people hmm. in this picture were getting run at quite hard, and Barry was one of those cases. So he was a, you know, he's a sort of China scholar who who had experience inside the U.S. government, and was going to China, you know, as a as a scholar to do field work, to meet people there, attend conferences, and I think his government background really marked him out to them as well as his his youth. You know, he was someone they thought who could probably go back into the U.S. government has a a lot of career ahead of him. And because he's early in his career, we can help guide that career. We can give him benefits. We can give him access. We can give him information that will get him promotions, will help land him the right jobs. So for years, he was cultivated and met with MSS officers affiliated with a, a front organization called China Reform Forum, who would invite him to conferences, take him around town, but it was quite interesting because those officers never actually pitched him in his telling of the story. They were very careful. They just wanted to build the relationship and kind of see where it would go, see if he landed it back inside government. They also seemed to really like taking him out and having fun. I think that was there was almost a bit of corruption on the MSS side, was that when they had this guy come out who in their system was was a target, it was an excuse to use operational funds to go take him out to a banquet, take him out to the bar, take him out to the massage parlor as they love to do. They did try some sort of probably like more crude attempts to entrap him. So they took him out to a massage parlor and the the masseuse tried to give him a happy ending, which he turned down. Another time they took one of these officers, took him out to a bar and kind of suddenly tried to confide in Barry and was saying, oh, you know, I've got this problem and you're the only one I can talk to about it. You know, you're a foreigner, you don't know anyone here, you can't tell anyone. So I just I really have to get this out. You know, I'm having an affair with this woman I work with, but I'm married, I have a kid, and I just want to leave and go off with this woman, but I'm not sure if she she's into me anymore. And I you know it's just it's it's really weighing on me. Barry, do you do you have anything you want to share about about your life? You know, you you having an affair as well? <laughs> Obviously it didn't work. I don't think Barry was having an affair anyway. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah, but you know, never, never something where they did wow. what you would call dropping cover, where they said, "Hey, we're actually not think tank scholars. I'm actually an officer of the MSS, and here I'm going to pay you to work for me," which was quite interesting. But it was a different story in two other provinces of China uh, that Barry went to that kind of speaks to this central provincial dynamic, where the center is much more cautious, has these long term objectives, a lot more professional. I think. Uh, but in one province of China, he got run at hard by an undercover, someone he believed was an undercover MSS officer who was just like, here are the women, you know, here's the money, uh, and here's the email address we'll use to communicate. You know, you write draft emails back to me in this email account. Don't send them, just leave them as drafts. I'll log into this account from China and read them. And that way there's no trail of communications between us. And then in another province of China, they were trying to they kind of co-opted someone who was close to him, tried to bribe him, put a lot of pressure onto him. So pitched by at least two parts of the MSS in different provinces and, and cultivated long-term by the headquarters uh, component. Hmm. They must have thought he was a, a real diamond in the rough in that case. 
Yeah, I mean, one, one interesting thing is it speaks to this long term approach, which, which is not unique to China, but just, you know, the resourcing and, and the prioritization of US operations, and I think Five Eyes operations in general, where you're going at people who are outside of government, people who you can send into government, people who are early career who, who don't have a big track record and investing in them long term and, and trying to build up that relationship because it might pay off in 10, 20 years. And, and that, to me, indicates how important U.S. operations were to the MSS in this time in the early 2000s. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it certainly paid a lot of dividends for them, it, it seems. Alex, you mentioned a minute ago the China Reform Forum, and I know that they also came up quite a bit in the book. So can you talk a little bit more broadly about that organization, not just in the context of Barry's uh, recruitment? Yeah, China Reform Forum was sort of the, in a way, the, the, the central front organization for some of the best MSS influence efforts that I looked at. It was a think tank attached to the sort of official academy for party officials, the Central Party School in Beijing. At least that was on paper. You know, its head was the former president or the deputy president of the Central Party School. But from its very founding, key people and key details associated with it were clearly MSS. So I think at one point its registered address was not the Central Party School, but a kind of nondescript building in Beijing that's also the address of one of these official MSS magazines and key officials, you know, the Secretary General, the Vice President of China Reform Forum, I was able to confidently establish were MSS officers, whether through interviews with intelligence officers who were aware of these cases, people like Barry who who were being run at by them, or just tracing their biographies and, and, and finding the MSS at some point, or seeing where they ended up after their time in China Reform Forum. You know, some people who were in China Reform Forum were later publicized because of promotions where they became vice ministers of the Ministry of State Security. Another one of these senior officials in China Reform Forum was actually Katrina Leung's handler, one of Katrina Leung's handlers. So he had that tie to the mm. MSS through that case. And you know, to me, it really signaled the, the rise of influence operations within the MSS. And it came after a period where the MSS had looked at what were mainly Chinese military attempts to influence US politics around the 96 presidential election sort of well-publicized case, people call it China Gate or Clinton Gate or Donor Gate, where sort of shady businessmen and, and women were donating money to the Democratic Party and, and also a bit to the Republican Party. And the money was ultimately traced back to Chinese military intelligence generals, and in one case, the head of Chinese military intelligence. And I actually found a paper by an MSS officer who was in Beijing during that time, sorry, in Washington, D.C. during that time, undercover as a journalist, and had then gone back to Beijing and sort of had to write a graduating essay as part of a, a party training course, not an MSS course, but a Chinese Communist Party course that he needed to go through to get promoted, essentially. And his essay was titled, A Few Thoughts on How to Strengthen Our Work on the U.S. Congress. So this was essentially him laying out his his ideas based on the failed influence operations of this 96 Clinton donation scandal, where he was saying, we need to not just focus on the presidency, we need to go broader in US society. We need to work on Congress, for example, we need to work on Chinese communities, we need to work on local districts of, of politics inside the United States, we need to work on businesses, uh, we need to work on academia. And putting this all together, uh, as someone who very quickly became a vice minister, of the Ministry of State Security. So that was, to me, kind of the lens through which I viewed China Reform Forum, which became prominent around the same time, was that the MSS was putting a lot more focus on influence work against the United States. And it picked this think tank that it had set up as, as the sort of vehicle to carry forward that mission. Okay, I see. Yeah, and they came up quite a bit, like I, I mentioned earlier. And I think that they were responsible for the rise of this theory that got banded about quite a bit, the, the peaceful rise of China, right? Can you uh, explain a little bit what that was and why it caught on so well? Yeah, really the central kind of message that came out of China Reform Forum and why it was so important was that this figurehead of the group, a guy called Zheng Bijian, former deputy head of the Central Party School, former senior propaganda official, 
and a sort of long-term advisor, long-time advisor to Chinese government leaders, was picked as the, the chairman of China Reform Forum. And in that period, he coined this theory of China's peace will rise. And it's it's kind of a you know term that's thrown around these days and, and quite widely known in a general sense. But when it was articulated, it was specifically this idea that China wasn't going to be like Nazi Germany, it wasn't going to be like Imperial Japan, uh, wasn't even going to be like the Soviet Union in terms of how it would grow into becoming a major power in international politics. It was this idea that China would essentially become integrated into the existing international order without disrupting it, without taking over it. It might want a little bit more influence as it deserved as a more important power, but it wasn't going to be locked into a kind of struggle or competition with the US. And I think, you know, it was quite remarkable looking back at literature. You know, we have the benefit of hindsight now where I don't think anyone believes that's the direction China's going in. Not even the Chinese Communist Party says that stuff very often these days, although it does does try to use the line occasionally. But, you know, back then you had a lot of influential people in government, in academia, in diplomacy, who I think you know, might have had some skepticism towards the idea of China's peaceful rise, but did see it as really encouraging regarding their their preconceptions and, and their belief that China was eventually moving in this direction. You know, they might have wanted to see more reassurance from China, but, you know, in response to this, this was one of the things I think that encouraged the US to put its put forward its policy of welcoming China into the international system as a responsible stakeholder. So the speech where that Bush era policy was introduced in 2005, delivered by a, a deputy head of the US Department of State. The opening of that speech is him talking about how he had such great experiences and interactions with China Reform Forum and Zheng Bijian, the head of China Reform Forum, during his recent trips to Beijing, and how people like Zheng Bijian and China Reform Forum were really important voices in setting the future direction of China and voices for change with a lot of political influence and say inside the Chinese government. You know, at the same time, you had party leaders actually repeating this theory of China's peaceful rise. So I think it was really influential, in certainly at least in reassuring people uh, about the direction that they thought China was going to go in. And I think is is itself the, the greatest example of an MSS influence operation, one that has been so consequential ultimately in affecting international policy towards China. Yeah, it's, it's incredible how disarming they are, I guess, because they are able to get over on, on so many people from, you know, young and easily influenced people, I guess, you know, traveling abroad for the first time, like you mentioned, who might be groomed for a better role, all the way up to these, you know, veteran diplomats and worldly people who just I, I'm stunned at how how well they can work on these people and kind of get into their ear and convince them to become an advocate for China's rise when and, th- and think that nothing bad can come of that with regard to our relations with them. Yeah. And another thing that really kind of surprised me was, you know, at, at the one hand, you have this this narrative of China's peaceful rise at a kind of high level, just being put out there and in speeches, that sort of thing. But it was really being backed up by these covert and clandestine MSS operations. What really stood out to me was looking at WikiLeaks cables coming from the US embassy in Beijing and searching the names of some of these MSS officers from China Reform Forum that I'd identified and finding that many of them were actually being treated as sort of protected sources for US diplomats who were giving them insight into Chinese politics. So they were going into the US embassy as you know, scholar associated with China Reform Forum, this liberal think tank that is close to the Chinese government, and giving them chicken feed about Chinese politics. You know things like, oh, I know because of my Chinese government contacts, this is the day when the National People's Congress is going to take place in a few months, and some diplomat can cable that back and you know get sort of get kudos for it when it turns out to actually be the correct date. The MSS hasn't given away anything of real value. And instead, it's actually built up trust. It's built up that relationship that was allowing these same MSS officers to tell diplomats things like uh, democratic reform inside China is inevitable. 
and the party has to revise its position on the Tiananmen massacre and past purges. Um, none of this happened. And I think, you know, you'd have to be really credulous to believe that these MSS officers were sort of secret reformists who chose to confide uh, in US diplomats uh, who were cabling this stuff back to DC, as opposed to them being from the Bureau of the MSS that specialized in influence operations that use this theory of China's peaceful rise to try to influence uh, US policy towards China. And we're saying things like this as part of that operation. Hmm. Incredible. So Alex, what do you think the future holds? Is China still kind of, do they have this kind of unfettered rise still ongoing or are people starting to wake up to the danger and, and the amount of influence that they have exerted over the rest of the world? Yeah, I think obviously the, you know, the theory of China's peaceful rise doesn't have much currency in the United States anymore. Um, but, you know, it's really remarkable to me how people kind of like to downplay the effectiveness of the Chinese system and, and China's general strategy. Uh, people would, would do it with the MSS and say they're kind of amateurish, you know, they don't use this sophisticated tradecraft. But as I found, not using that sophisticated tradecraft was actually something that helped make them so effective in building relationships and, and influencing people. And it's the same with Chinese strategy today. I think, you know, while you're not going to be convincing President Biden that China is about to become a democracy, so you should ease off and, and push help and, and encourage them to be more democratic. That still has a lot of currency, I think, in other countries. I think recently, you know, you saw the president of, of France meet with the president of China and almost position it as him being this middle ground between China and the United States. And definitely in mm. less developed countries, you know, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, Central Asia, the Middle East, you know, I don't think they have any particular, a lot of these countries don't have any particular issue with China's political system. And China's having a lot of success running operations there, building influence, buying up politicians. Recently in Australia, there was a lot of fear around security, a security deal that was signed between the government of the Solomon Islands and China that was essentially seen as opening up the way to greater Chinese military access to a Pacific island with, with a lot of strategic importance to Australia and the United States. So China's still okay. having a lot of success in many countries. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's not surprising. They are relentless, certainly. What do you think can or and should be done really to counter all of this spreading influence all over the world? I mean, are effective steps being taken anywhere right now? Yeah, there are, there are things to learn from, from a lot of countries, but no one country, I think, has quite worked out the model. It's a relatively new problem. You know, in Australia, we talk about countering foreign interference. US government seems to prefer the terminology of you know, countering malign influence. In Europe, you hear a lot about gray zone warfare and political warfare, hybrid warfare from, from Russia. But overall, I think a really important thing is actually having laws in place to criminalize these activities. Until about 2018, covertly trying to influence Australian politics on behalf of a foreign government was not illegal. And I think that's still the case in a lot of other countries because laws are designed around espionage, around mm. stealing secrets. But not a lot of countries have robust laws against foreign covert political influence. So that's one foundation. But the other challenge is actually having the policy to follow through with that. And there are so many trade-offs that governments struggle to make between, on the one hand, you know, being tough on China, having a strong security posture, prosecuting your interests and, and rebuilding the China relationship after years of basing it on ideas like China's peaceful rise, which is in your long-term interest, but incurs a lot of short-term hurt in economic terms, in diplomatic terms, even in some ways in, in a political sense where Australia, for example, until very recently, China applied sort of broad sanctions and economic coercion to different sectors, you know, banning imports of different things, cutting down imports of barley, beef, red wine, lobsters, and so on, trying to kind of turn the tap and, and reduce the flow of Chinese students studying in Australian universities. Um, and you have a lot of backlash from the business sector to these activities, people complaining about politicians mishandling the relationship in China, China refusing to meet 
with Australian government officials and Australian political leaders. So I think, you know, I think it's a really, it's a really challenging policy problem. And the other thing is, from the intelligence community's perspective, countering influence work is an uncomfortable space to be in, in a lot of cases. I think, you know, when you're seeing one of your own politicians being cultivated or manipulated by a foreign intelligence service, you know, in the words of one former US government intelligence official I spoke to, like, you'd have to be stupid to build your career on that sort of thing because you piss everyone off in the process. The bosses don't want to have to deal with a political case. They don't want to have to deal with politicians. They don't want to upset people like that. It's much easier in a way dealing with things like economic espionage where there's no political controversy. But if you're seen to expose someone on one side of politics for having ties to the Chinese Communist Party, it can be very challenging as an intelligence agency that that needs to and importantly tries to maintain its political independence in our democratic systems. The other thing I, I think is really important is just the capability to do this. You know, I do all this research basically in open source, supplemented with some interviews, uncovering fronts and cover stories of MSS officers. And I think that's a really important part of countering influence because when you're building these cases on signals intelligence or, or human source information, it's much harder to actually make that public and to act on it. But you know, the story of China's peaceful rise can be exposed and could have been exposed at the time as an MSS operation, but it wasn't. But I think doing that through open source at the time could have really changed how people understood China and the MSS. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It would have been better to nip it in the bud when the opportunity presented itself to begin with. You know, what you say about this, the difficulty in pursuing this from a law enforcement perspective, I, I can totally see that and why they want to prioritize something that will ultimately end up in an arrest, which is, is seems like it would be very, very hard to do in these influence cases because it's not like money and classified information are being exchanged at meetings, like you said, which is kind of the, the bread and butter of so many of these high profile cases in the past. So a lot harder to justify man hours and budget and that sort of thing towards this when they can focus more on traditional espionage, like you said, when this is as real of a threat, if not a larger threat. Yeah, I think you can see the same challenges play out in countering interference from Russia, that it's it's such a politicized thing and it's so hard to build cases on it. And, you know, this is really, I think, a weak point in democratic societies, our ability to manage uh, influence in politics more broadly, not just from foreign sources, but it, you know, it's especially problematic when it's coming from a foreign government that is actively hostile to your 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 values and and your strategy. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Amazing. Well, Alex, this has been very very fascinating and enlightening because I, I do not feel like I'm nearly as well read as I should be on these kind of operations. And luckily, here you are to save the day with your book. So for those of you who want to pick up the book, there is a lot more to this story than just what Alex and I have discussed so far. The book is Spies and Lies, How China's Greatest Covert Operations Fooled the World by Alex Josky. Alex, are you working on another book right now or do you have some other project going on now that this has been out for a while? No, no, no other books in the works, but I'm trying to kind of get out some of my more historical research on, on the origins of the Chinese intelligence community, because it's still, I think, such an unexplored field and, and, and there's so much we don't know about how China operates. And I'm hoping to keep filling that in. Okay, fantastic. Are you, are you publishing in like a, a journal or online or what exactly? Yeah, so mainly sort of academic journals, you know, online publications. I recently put out a paper on that provincial structure of the Ministry of State Security and trying to map that out and, oh, okay. and operations coming out of them. Okay, fantastic. And do you have any sort of like a public facing social media or website or anything like that if people want to connect with you and kind of follow along with your writings? Yeah, people can um, follow me on, on, on Twitter or, or send me a message there or, or on LinkedIn. Those are probably the best ways to get in touch and follow my work. Okay. Okay, great. I will look you up there and we'll put your handle in the show notes of this episode if that's all right with you. Great. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you, Alex. This has been very, very enlightening. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to reading some more of your articles as you publish them. Thanks, Justin. Good luck with all the future podcasts. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram 
at Spycraft101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.